Why should anybody trust the Bible? It's a great question, and one I didn't receive any satisfying answers to when I was a child growing up attending church. And it's also partly the reason why later on, around 15 or 16, I rebelled and stopped going to church, and soon after identified as an atheist. But after becoming a born-again Christian in December 2015, I've learned that the Bible is indeed extremely reliable, and in this video, we're going to learn why. I came to believe that the belief in the Bible as the Word of God was just circular reasoning. Because people would say, the Bible is the Word of God. And I would say, well, why do you think so? Why is it? They would say, because the Bible says so. I was like, wait, so you think it's the Word of God because the Bible says it's the Word of God. It is It is what it is because it says what it is. I, I, I never found that to be a satisfactory kind of answer. However, there are actually many reasons why we can be very confident that the Bible is reliable and is indeed the Word of God. First off, the Bible was written early, not late. You may have heard claims that the Gospel accounts, the New Testament, were written two to three hundred years after the, the death of Jesus. And this, this kind of idea was, was popularized or certainly made, made famous by Bill Maher in his mockumentary religious. To destroy such a false claim, I want to turn to J. Warner Wallace. He is a cold case homicide detective and he used his detective and forensic skills initially to disprove the eyewitness accounts of the Gospels because he was an angry atheist, an ardent atheist, but when he applied his skills to the gospel accounts as eyewitness testimony, he came out a believer. In section two of his book called Cold Case Christianity, he puts forward four questions for us to figure out if the gospel writers were indeed eyewitness testimony. The first question is, were they present? Like, were they literally there? Secondly, were they corroborated? Thirdly, were they accurate? And fourthly, were they biased? So, using these four questions, let's find out and see if the gospel accounts are indeed eyewitness testimony. So the first question is, were they present? Were they actually there at the time of the first century? Were there real people actually in that place with providing, it was with eyewitness testimony? Well, J. Warner Wallace Highlights, the New Testament fails to describe the temple destruction. The New Testament fails to describe the siege of Jerusalem, which was AD 70. Luke says nothing about the death of Paul, AD 64, death of Peter around AD 65, or James, mother of Jesus, in AD 62. Luke's gospel predates the book of Acts. Luke was mostly written between A.D. 50 to 53, and Acts was most likely written between A.D. 57 and A.D. 60. Paul quotes Luke's gospel in his letter to Timothy. Paul echoes the claims of the gospel writers. Paul quotes Luke's gospel in his letter to Corinthians, and Paul cites Luke between A.D. 53 and 57. Luke quotes Mark and Matthew repeatedly, Mark's gospel appears to be an early crime broadcast. Mark was most likely written between AD 45 and 50. Mark appears to be protecting key players, and the temple destruction is predicted. So J. Warner Wallace came to the conclusion that all of these bits of evidence actually point to very, very early, and in fact that they were there at the time. He the accounts don't give us any reason to dismiss them as it just being a myth. Therefore, it's very, very plausible that the writers were indeed there in the first century as eyewitness testimony and not later falsification supposedly in the second or third century. The second question is, were they corroborated? Now, 
for that for them to be corroborated there has to be internal consistency they has to use the correct type of names of people in that time they have to know the correct place of names they have to have an understanding of the cultural societal religious elements going on at that time and j warner wallace concludes the gospel writers provided unintentional eyewitness support gospel writers reference names correctly the gospel writers used appropriate language the gospel writers identified the correct locations Non-biblical eyewitnesses corroborated the Gospels, and ancient Jewish writers corroborated the Gospels. Therefore, with the above, it's very plausible that, yes, the writers were there, and it's corroborated by various pieces of internal and external evidence. Unlike, for example, some of the later fake gospels like we have the gospel of thomas the gospel of barnabas the gospel of jesus these were clearly written centuries later because they didn't understand the the place names even some of the people's names are changed so there's a lot of these later gospels that are clearly clearly false yet the accuracy and the corroboration of the gospels indicate very early and, and are reliable the third question is were they accounts accurate in other words did they get things right or wrong j warner wallace concludes paul students confirm the accuracy of the gospels peter's students confirm the accuracy of the gospels the eyewitnesses were conscious and protective the copyists and scribes were meticulous ignatius polycarp and clement quoted scripture though not always word for word so we see that we can be quite confident that what we have today was exactly what was passed on at the beginning. They haven't been distorted. They haven't been corrupted. We know that right from the beginning, we have what's called like the, 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 the chain of protection, chain of custody. Peter's apostles wrote what Peter said, and they copied that. And then it was copied, and then copied, copied. Paul's, uh, Paul's apostles, uh, disciples, copied what he said. We have this chain of evidence or chain you know, in the custody that comes from various lines of people in various different places, and they all meticulously copied down what was written, and they all agree in what was said. The fourth question is, were they biased? Well, this is a bit of a strange question because if anybody wants to present information, they have an agenda. So in one way, they're biased because they want to present their, uh, their perspective of what happened. But what's very interesting to note is that these people were reporting what they saw. In other words, they were not biased before they saw what happened. They met Jesus. They lived with him. They saw him die. And they saw him resurrected. It's only because of what they saw and what they experienced are they now professing what they saw. They didn't make it up. So in a sense, yes, they're biased. They're wanting to push an agenda. They want to explain, this is what happened to us. And we're explaining to you what happened. So yes, in that sense, they're biased. But I mean, everybody's biased in some way. So a bit of a strange question. But anyway, John J. Warner Wallace concludes... The apostles were not driven by financial gain. The apostles were not driven by sex or relationship. The apostles were not driven by the pursuit of power. In fact, many of them were persecuted and even martyred. So taking into account those four questions, it's actually very plausible that what is recorded in the Gospels is actually what happened. Another point to consider is the manuscript reliability. Up until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, the oldest complete Old Testament was the Leningrad Codex, which is dated to around 1048 AD. Now, what was particularly exciting about the find in Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, is that now we have many, many Old Testament scrolls that dated to over a thousand years earlier than the Leningrad Codex. But the earliest 
was from around 200 BC, so before the time of Jesus. Now, if we have all of these older manuscripts, much, much older manuscripts, if there's been any changes or corruption, then it would be quite easy to compare the text from 1048 AD to text over a thousand years before. What was the result? According to biblicalarchaeologyreport.com, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls allowed scholars to see how much the biblical text had changed in over 1,000 years of transmission. They discovered that very little had changed and that Hebrew Bible had been transmitted with incredible accuracy over a millennium. So there's very, very, very little changes. There are some changes, but it was very, very high accuracy, which means that we can be quite sure that the text we have today is the text that was originally written. The New Testament is also extremely reliable. Some might say more reliable. We have over 25,000 New Testament documents, scrolls and fragments, um, of all languages, there's over 5,000 Greek, but 25,000 including all different languages. If you look at the chart, we can see here that the New Testament writings are far more numerous than any other ancient document, but also the time elapsed that we have of any copies is much, much shorter. For example, New Testament writings the original composition dates were around 49 to 95 AD. The earliest manuscripts we have is around 117 AD, which means that the time elapsed from the original to the copy is as little as 30 to up to 150 years. Now, that might seem a lot, but compared to other ancient documents, it, it, it's very, very good. For example, Homer's Iliad, there's 400 years difference between when it was written and the earliest copy. Aristotle's writings, time elapsed 1,200 years from time written to the earliest manuscript, the earliest copy. Demosthenes' speeches, 1,400 years difference. And Caesar's Gallic Wars is 1,000 years. Interestingly, none of these ancient documents listed are put into doubt by historians. In fact, they, they take it to be true. Despite the large number of years between the origin of writing and the copies, the New Testament is far more reliable, far more accurate in its transmission than these ancient documents. Yet why is it only the New Testament is put under so much scrutiny and disbelief? If it was a secular document, it would be accepted. When all of the 25,000 plus New Testament fragments and documents are compared to each other, we have a very high accuracy of around 95 to 99 percent accuracy of transmission. However, you might be surprised to learn that there are actually 400,000 errors in the New Testament manuscripts. And this is true. Well, some say 300,000 to 400,000 errors. Now, if that's literally the, true, the case, it means that there's around three to four mistakes per word in the entire New Testament. But is that the case? Greek scholar D.A. Carson sums up the reliability of the New Testament in this way. The purity of text is of such a substantial nature that nothing we believe to be true and nothing we are commanded to do is in any way jeopardized by the variance. So these errors or variants or differences do not in any way alter the meaning of the text. Everything we're commanded to do or not to do and all the key doctrines of the faith are not changed. But there are differences. So how do we understand these differences or these variations? The first point I'd like to make is that we have such a high number of documents. We have over 25,000 New Testament scrolls and fragments. The more of a document you have, the more chances there are there's going to be errors contained within them. Likewise, the fewer number of documents you have, there's going to be fewer number of errors. That's just common sense. But what are the types of errors or variants or differences? 
Well, it turns out that the most number of you know errors is due to spelling. Just difference in spelling, either a scribal error or words change over time, right? So language is organic. Words change in spelling, uh, even in meaning, right? So, But often spelling, I think is around, if I'm not mistaken, around 80% of all of the mistakes is just a spelling mistake, either scribal error or changes in how words are spelled. Other reasons why there's, it, uh, there's some differences is that Words change, the meaning of words change, and also grammar changes. So later on, when they were copying, let's say a few hundred years later, they would adjust the, the grammar of that day. They wouldn't keep the old grammar because it might not be you know, understood, but they, they changed it to new grammar. That's one and another reason. Oh, sometimes um, there were copious errors. Um, for example, words were inverted together, or sometimes... They were, they were copying a phrase because of, often it would be going across, but they might go down, for example. So it's very clear when you have a large number of documents, it's actually very easy to identify any errors, which is also uh, an, uh, perhaps an unintended benefit of having so many documents is that it's so much easier to see if there's a mistake or an error. In fact, it was, I think it was Frank Turek who said, the best way to preserve an original, you know, original document is not to have the original, but to have many, many copies. And that makes sense. If someone's got the original, later on, they could change the original. And then anything else that was copied can be claimed to be fake. But if you don't have the original, because, you know, the original was written, but then people copied it so many times, eventually it faded away. You know, we don't have the originals anymore, but we do have the copies and that preserves what's in the original. However, there is a small percentage, very, very small percentage of when scribes added something to the text. They shouldn't have done this, but we know. So sometimes they added a verse here or there um, for whatever reason. Maybe they thought it would make more sense. Um, maybe they were trying to insert a theological point that they thought the readers might appreciate. We don't know why, but yes, there are some scribal editions. But again, it does not change any of the court key or core doctrines. In fact, the Bible scholar Daniel Wallace says, in the entire text of 20,000 lines, only 40 lines are in doubt, about 400 words, and none affects any significant doctrine. So to wrap things up, the Bible has undergone an extensive textual criticism both in the Old and New Testament, and it has held up very well in its reliability. Despite claims from numerous critics, the Bible is not just made up and it hasn't been changed or corrupted over time, as evidenced by the textual analysis compared to the Dead Sea Scrolls and also analysis of the New Testament uh, texts that we have. Archaeology as well also confirms many events listed or detailed in the both Old and New Testaments. Well, that's the end of this video. Thanks so much for watching. Remember to hit that notification bell, comment on the video, share the video, and like the video. And remember, faith is not fairy tales and God is real.